don't care if these are poison. There's chocolate and peanut butter and caramel in these some bitches. I call them some bitches. <laughs> Here, have another some bitch. No more some bitches. Give me the damn phone. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week I'm recording my VO in an airport with my head under a micro fleece blanket. So we'll see how this goes as we attempt to make something tasty out of chocolate, peanut butter, and caramel. Don't even know how that's going to be possible, but we're going to try. First up, we have a whole bunch of these old school square caramels that we have to unwrap first, of course, before cutting them into fours. Once cut into fours, I'm going to sort of try to roll them into little rounds. I don't think this is going to matter because they're probably just going to melt in the cookie, but that is my plan, and I and blindly stubborn. After rolling them all up into nice little balls, we can get started working on our cookie dough. And the cookies on the show look to me like those thin, crispy little guys you get from Tate's, which starts out like a normal enough cookie dough. We're gonna measure out eight and one half ounces of all-purpose flour, to which we're going to add one teaspoon each, baking soda and kosher salt, and tiny whisk to combine. Then in the bowl of the stand mixer goes two sticks of unsalted butter, and three quarters of a cup each of granulated sugar and firmly packed light brown sugar. Place that into your stand mixer, a fixed paddle attachment, and then we're going to cream these guys together, during which time we're also going to add a teaspoon of vanilla extract. I should mention that the butter is room temperature, which is gonna help it cream very quickly and easily, about one minute. Once those are good and creamed, we're adding two large eggs. Once those eggs have been added, we're going to scrape down the sides of the bowl and cream again for maybe one to two minutes until creamy. Lift up the paddle, scrape down the sides of the bowl one last time, and then it's time to add our dry ingredients. All at once, no need to be fancy here. We're just gonna mix this in until a no more than 30 to 45 seconds, be sure not to overmix unless you want tough cookies. Now, at long last, it's time to add our mix-ins. Chocolate chips, peanut butter chips, and our chopped up caramels? Caramels? Let me know how you say it in the comments below. Scrape all the delicious cookie dough out the paddle attachment, and then it's time to use a tiny ice cream scoop or melon baller to scoop out uniform little nubbins of cookie dough. Maybe one to two tablespoons worth spaced out evenly on a parchment lined baking sheet, and then into a 375 degree Fahrenheit oven, it goes for 10 to 12 minutes. Make sure not to try and scrape these off until they are cooled completely, as the molten caramel will adhere them to the parchment paper like glue. Also, that batch looked a little bit too large to be taped so I'm downgrading the nubbins to an even tablespoon, which, as you might imagine, made them come out just about right, and if you can manage to just wait for once in your life for cookies to cool completely, they will pop off just like that. So they look both like Tate's and the cookies from the show, but what do they taste? Oop, they're a little bit tricky to stack, but no matter, because they've got that signature Tate's snap, and they taste exactly how you'd imagine. Thin, buttery, crispy, caramelly, chocolatey, peanut buttery, but they have a fatal flaw. The caramel, you see, turns chewier than bazooka bubblegum once it's allowed to cool, so we are going to take a page or two out of cookie demigod Christina Tosi's book and refer to her justifiably famous peanut butter cookies. Plus, all her recipes are measured out in grams. Y'all know how much I like that. Once we've measured out all of our wet ingredients, including 50 grams of glucose, which you can find on Amazon, it's time to start combining the dry. 225 grams of bread flour, 2 grams of baking powder, 1 gram of baking soda, and a whopping 9 grams of kosher salt. It would seem as though Christina likes her cookies salty. We're going to tiny whisk those together, and then it's time to contend with the butter, this time only a stick and a half. Like Likewise, room temperature placed into the bowl of a stand mixer with 300 grams of granulated sugar and our 50 grams of glucose syrup. If you can't find glucose, you can use light corn syrup, but it's not going to have the same consistency in the end. And now begins the first of three beatings. We are beating this first mixture together on medium-high speed for two to three minutes until light and fluffy, scraping down the sides of the bowl, adding 260 grams of creamy peanut butter, and beating on medium-high speed for 30 seconds or until just combined. Then at this point, with the mixer running on slow, we're going to add the eggs slowly, one at a time, until just combined, about 30 seconds, along with half a gram of vanilla extract before beating mercilessly on high speed for three minutes until light, creamy, and doubled in volume. Last but not least, we need to add our pre-combined dry ingredients after scraping down the bowl one more time, of course, adding the dry stuff and then mixing minimally, about 30 seconds on medium-low speed until just combined. And now it's time to address the caramel portion of our cookie. Christina uses chopped up peanut brittle in her cookie, so we're just going to emulate that without the peanuts. Simply caramelize some granulated sugar over medium-low heat until amber in color, pour out onto some parchment, and 
am allowed to cool completely before peeling away from the parchment and smashing into teeny tiny bits. According to a recipe, we don't want any pieces larger than a grain of rice, presumably because once these things reharden, they could probably take a tooth out. So we're gonna smash them up nice and good before dumping them into our cookie dough, and then it's time to talk chocolate. You can use chocolate chips if you like, but I like chopped chocolate as it makes a bunch of different sized little pieces and streaks throughout the cookie. So coarsely chop up about four to six ounces of high quality dark chocolate and dump it on in. We are then once again going to slowly and gently mix together just to evenly incorporate our mix-ins. And there you have it, some very serious indeed cookie dough, which is unfortunately not yet ready to bake. We must first portion out the cookie dough, about two to three tablespoons worth each, onto a parchment lined baking sheet. Give them plenty of space as they are bound to expand, and then we're going to pat down the tops a little bit to make them into evenly proportioned chubby little discs, which we are then going to stack and wrap prodigiously in plastic wrap because these guys are headed into the fridge for as little as three hours and as much as three days. First, I gotta clean out my fridge here. Got some real science projects going on in the back. The longer you age your cookie dough for, the better it's going to look and taste, so try to be patient. Once those are done chilling, we're just gonna unwrap them. These are an experimental giant batch and pop them in a 375 degree Fahrenheit oven for 15 to 18 minutes, after which time they will emerge beautifully golden brown and crisp. And there you have it, two different versions of some bitches. Oop, oh, I'm sorry. Some bitches. Wait, seriously? I can't say some bitches. They said it on network television. Let's try this one more time. Some bitches. There we go. Big thank you to whoever's editing this. Oh, wait, it's me. Ain't I a stinker? Anyway, now that we got the horseplay out of the way, how do these look, feel, and taste? And the answer to all three of those questions is amazing. The outsides are crisp, but the glucose gives the interiors a distinct chewiness. And you should stop whatever you're doing and make them right now. Yeah.